now on to our speaker for today, which almost needs no introduction. All one of the most recognizable faces in our community for sure, and certainly a respected leader, is uh, Scott McClellan, who's president of HEB Food and Drugs. Uh, he's part of the board of directors of the Greater Houston Partnership. He's founded a nonprofit called uh, Good Reason that's involved in some educational pursuits. But uh, he simply likes to be introduced as the HEB guy. And we are anxious to hear Scott talk about the topic of resilience today. So we'll welcome Scott on into our virtual room here. And there, I'm here. There he is. Right. <laughs> Scott, to, thanks so I'm much for being here today. Good to be with you and everyone else today. Well, and uh, yeah. thanks folks for taking time out of your schedule uh, to visit for a little while. and. You know, as I thought about things to talk about, I have a bunch of canned presentations and I thought, you know, right now, I think what could be beneficial for people to hear about is resiliency. Uh, because clearly, I think for most people, 2020 has been a year unlike any other. You know, and if you uh, look in the book of Psalms, it talks about to be resilient, you have to be strong in the Lord. And no question, I think everyone's faith has been tested to a certain extent, just in the changes of our lives that we've seen come over the course of this last year. It's been difficult, it's been hard. None of us like wearing masks and the way in which we just do life has, been, has changed quite a bit. But one of the things that I've really come to realize about myself over the course of my life and my career, it's that when times are the toughest, it's really when I've learned the most about myself. And while going through difficult times, whether it's COVID-19 uh, or difficult times at work or challenges that I may have had with my family, that while it's unpleasant, I've always found that when I've come out the other end, that I've come out a bigger person and I've learned more about myself as a result of that. And so what I thought I would do today is just share with you a series of stories that uh, I've uh, heard either from my own life or uh, from people that I've met and stories that they've shared with me. And then at the end, I'll bring it back around to COVID-19. And where I'll talk quite a bit about um, is talking about my dad. Uh, since I was born my father's son, I thought I'd talk a little bit about his life and some of the things that uh, affected him in his life that went on to affect me. And even though he's been uh, dead now for 15 years, it continues to do so in a significant way. Uh, my dad was born in a two-room house in rural Missouri in 1912, and he was the youngest of five children. The house didn't have electricity or running water. In fact, when I went back to visit it when I was five years old, it still didn't have running water in it. Um, his dad went on, went to dig the Panama Canal when my dad was uh, very young, and he left his mom behind to raise five kids on a farm. His oldest brother died when he was three, and when his dad returned from Panama, his mom had a nervous breakdown. They didn't have much. When my dad was five, uh, they raised hogs on their farm, and he ground off his index finger in a corn chopper while he was grinding up corn cobs to feed the pigs. He had a lifelong nickname of nine and a half where he was missing his <laughs> index finger on his, uh, on his right hand. Uh, but he made the best of it. He uh, certainly had a lot of fun with uh, uh, showing young kids how he could make his finger disappear. Um, his parents sold uh, my dad's horse when he was 12 because they didn't have enough to eat. And when my dad was 14, he ran away from home and he hitchhiked from Rolla, Missouri to Detroit to try to get a job in a car factory. They wouldn't hire him because he was too young and he lost a little bit of money that he did have with him shooting dice on the corner with a guy who had crooked dice. So he was hungry and he hitchhiked all the way back to Missouri. You know, in, a, in punctuation, a period is defined as a full stop at the end of a declarative sentence. And in life, uh, there are many periods that mark a dead end for us, uh, potential to just stop your program, progress. My dad had a lot of these in his life, and his first attempt at breaking out of poverty was met with complete failure as he hitchhiked back from Detroit, back to the farm. He came back and he went to school in the one-room schoolhouse in his town. He always told me he was the third best speller in his class. His graduating class had three people in it. <laughs> uh, he graduated from high school at 17, and the day after he graduated, he got on a train and he rode it to California. See, one thing about my dad, and I think one of the things you'll hear over the course of these stories, is he kept his options open. He didn't have anything, so he really didn't have anything to lose. 
the year he went to California was 1921 and the country had just fallen into the Great Depression. My dad moved in with four other guys and found a job uh, in a laundry. I remember when I was young that my dad would break up soda crackers in a glass and pour buttermilk over them. That was dinner for him when he first came to California. And when I was young, he didn't have to eat soda crackers and buttermilk anymore, but I think there was something about eating those soggy crackers that reminded him of where he came from. Eventually, over time, my dad saved up enough money to buy his own laundry, but it was in the worst, absolute worst part of Los Angeles because that was all my dad could afford. But I don't think my dad ever looked at life in terms of periods, meaning those hard stops when a disappointment would uh, arise, he'd pick himself up and he'd plod forward and he'd put one step ahead of the other. And sometimes the hardest decision is the decision to simply keep going. But every defeat doesn't have to define who you are, but rather where you are at that point in time in your life. When I moved to Houston, I reconnected with a friend of mine who sold luncheon meat uh, to HEB. Her name was Naomi Warren. She was a Holocaust survivor. And I had her dinner with her one night in 2008 when she told me about her experience. And I went home afterwards and I wrote this in my journal. We had dinner with Holocaust survivor Naomi Warren and her son Benjamin tonight. And as always, time with Naomi yields an amazing insight into her strength, power, and attitude. She declared that the Holocaust made her a better person. Let me read that again. She declared that the Holocaust made her a better person. Naomi commented that she was raised spoiled and self-absorbed, and the Holocaust experience led her to be not only tougher, but also more empathetic. And she said that after World War II, she got on a boat and sailed into New York City, and when she saw the Statue of Liberty, that she made a decision that while she wouldn't forget her past, she was going to live her life looking forward. She wondered out loud how much longer she could stay alive when she was in the concentration camp. She said that when she woke up in the morning, she's glad that she, uh, um, she, she would see herself in the window as she walked by, and she would see someone who was thin and that she just didn't even recognize. Um, but she said even in these later years in her life that um, when she gets out of bed, sometimes she doesn't feel well, but she puts one foot in front of the other and she knows once she gets going, she'll feel better. I wonder if she felt the same way about the concentration camps and whether this is how she was able to survive. Or as my wife sometimes says, motion is the lotion. If you'll just get up and get going, eventually momentum will carry you through the day. I don't ever remember my dad complaining about anything. He just didn't. He just put one foot ahead of the other. When I was 11, my dad developed a growth on his prostate gland and he went in to have a biopsy. During surgery, a blood vessel was ruptured and my dad bled out and he died. They brought him back to life though and they gave him 13 transfusions. He survived, but he had so much scar tissue in his urinary tract that it would take him 30 minutes to urinate. One of the transitions, one of the transfusions was tainted and it gave him hepatitis C and he lived with that for the rest of his life. He endured. Two years later, he developed colon cancer. Two years after that, he had a triple coronary bypass. When he was 65, a customer at his laundry attacked him. The guy was 26 and he was a tree trimmer. It wasn't a particularly fair fight. He broke my dad's nose and his ribs. My dad broke his hands, broke his hand when he broke the other guy's nose. Everyone who worked for my dad just stood there and watched. My dad drove himself to the hospital and he drove himself home and got into bed. He never complained. He just kept going. He'd pick himself up from whatever curve life threw at him and he'd just find a way to move on. And that's what resilience is. It means not giving up. My dad lived to be 91 years old. There's a fable called the Taoist of the farmer uh, with one horse. It was this farmer, he had one horse and the horse ran away. And his neighbor said, this is such bad news. You must feel so upset. And the farmer said, we'll see. Well, a few days later, the horse returned with 30 wild horses following him. Uh, and the man and his corral and his son corralled all 31 horses. And the neighbor said, congratulations, this is such good news. You must be so happy. The man replied, we'll see. Well, one of the wild horses kicked the man's son, breaking both of his legs. And his neighbor said, this is such bad news. You must feel so upset. And the man said, we'll see. 
shortly after that, the country went to war and every able-bodied able, every able young man was drafted to fight. Uh, the war was terrible and killed almost every young man, but the farmer's son was spared because his legs kept him from being drafted. His broken legs kept him from being drafted. His neighbor said, congratulations, this is such good news, you must be so happy. The man said, we'll see. And that's the end of the fable. Saying we'll see has the same characteristics of not knowing this that resiliency has. Things are really never as bad as you think they are, and things are never as good as you think they are. The key is to find a way to just keep moving forward. My dad had a rule that when you either went to school or you worked, you didn't sit around. And in the summers, I would go with him and sort the dirty laundry or ride with the route drivers in the summers. I got a paper route when I was 11 and I had about 100 customers on my paper route. And sometimes if the weather was bad, my dad would drive me in the back of his station wagon and I'd throw papers out the back. Frequently, the newspaper would bring what they called ad inserts, like supermarket ads, that I would have to insert into the newspaper. And this wasn't the best part of having a paper route. And one, every once in a while, what they would do would be to circle back around and give me a second set of inserts. So after I had finished folding all my newspapers, they brought another set of inserts that I would have to go back and put in a second time. Well, I just went on a rant about this at the dinner table, how I wasn't gonna put that second set of inserts into the paper. I was mad and I vented. And apparently I did it for too long because my dad eventually had enough. He reached around and whacked me upside of the head. Food went flying out of my mouth. It was raining that night. He told me I could deliver all the papers on foot. I never complained again. When I was 16, he'd heard that a steel plant near where we lived was hiring and that the pay was good because it was a union job. He told me to go fill out an application, so I did. And that night when I got home, he asked me if I got the job. And I said they told me that they'd call me. He told me to go back down the next day and ask if they'd hire me. I told them they said they'd call me. He told me no, I was gonna go down there and go in person. I didn't wanna go, he told me to go anyway. So I went back to the steel plant for five days in a row and asked for a job. They finally gave it to me as a janitor on the swing shift making $4.78 an hour. I think it happened because they just got tired of seeing me in their waiting room. My dad said it was because I persevered. But here's what I learned that summer. You get one sponge and use that one sponge to clean the urinals and the toilet seat and the drinking fountains. And I really have never taken a drink out of a drinking fountain since the summer of 1973. Earlier this year, uh, NBC affiliates were in town and K uh, uh, Channel 2 asked me if I would come and speak to their general managers. Uh, I didn't realize it, but Hoda Copy was on the same program that I was on and I got a chance to meet Hoda who is even more delightful in person than she is on the Today Show. And she told the story that evening of searching for her first job when she got out of college. She uh, graduated from college and drove through the South and was turned down at 27 different stations over 10 days before she landed her first job. She said she, that she was told she wasn't Roanoke enough, if that's even a thing. She was driving through the South searching for this job and she went through Greensville, Mississippi which I like to think I know my geography, but I didn't know there was a Greensville, Mississippi, or that it was an MSA big enough to have a TV station. But there was a billboard there that said, CBS has its eye on you, so she stopped by the station. And the station manager was a guy named Stan Sardoni. And he said that they were looking for someone as a writer, and he took her tape and he watched all 30 minutes of it. And Hoda said, nobody watches 30 minutes of a, of a, uh, uh, of a tape. And he told her, I like what I'm seeing. And two weeks later, uh, while she was sitting writing copy, the station manager, Stan, came up and asked her if she had a blazer. And she said, you mean a sport coat? And he said, yeah. And she responded, yeah, I do. Said, that's good because our anchor, Ann Martin, is out sick, so you're going to be doing the news tonight. Hoda thought, who knew that all it was going to take to get onto an anchor desk at a TV show on a TV station was to have a navy blue blazer. So she got on the air and sat down at the teleprompter and she opened by saying, this is the news and I'm Ann Martin. It went downhill from there. She said that the newscast was like riding a toboggan down a series of bumps. And after the newscast, she went to Piggly Wiggly and a disheveled woman in a house coat and no teeth came up to her and told her that she'd seen her on TV that night and said, bless your heart, maybe you'll do better tomorrow. But it was sure that she was gonna be fired. 
but she showed up the next day and the station manager asked her if she still had the blazer. Hoda said she did, and he told her that Ann Martin was still sick and he'd give her another chance. You see, you never know when your chance is going to come, regardless of where you are in terms of your life. I don't know if you know what an ellipsis is, but an ellipsis, uh, if you send a text to someone and someone is writing a text back to you, an ellipsis are those three dots that you see at the bottom of your phone. I use them frequently when I'm writing an informal email and my thought isn't fully complete. A period signifies the end of something, but an ellipsis shows that there's something more to come. And I don't know about you, but when I send a text to someone and I see those three dots, the ellipsis show up on my screen, there's somewhat of a sense of anticipation, like I wonder what they're gonna write back. Without knowing it, I think my dad looked at life as a series of ellipsis. But the way he did it was to insert the word yet when it came to the end of a sentence. Those were his three dots. Saying yet opens a dialogue where possibilities can happen. Saying yet lets, lets your mind think that you can, even when you think you can't. So unlike us, there weren't any training programs in the laundry that my dad owned. There weren't any mentor or support groups back in the 30s, late 30s, when he bought his laundry. He didn't have the safety uh, net of a corporate infrastructure to turn to and ask questions for help. He was out there on his own trying to figure it out as he went along with a daughter at that time, no son, because my sister's at this 18 and a half years older than I am. Uh, talk about being a mistake, that would be me. Well, early on, my dad couldn't afford his bookkeeper, so he said, you know, I don't know how to keep the books yet. When he bought his first laundry, he really couldn't afford to pay for somebody to repair the equipment. And this was a conundrum because if the equipment didn't work, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't clean laundry. And so he had to learn how to fix the machines. He just didn't know how to do it yet. When his spotter, that's the person who takes the spots out of the dry cleaning, didn't show up to work because he was hung over, my dad had to learn how to spot. He didn't know how, but he didn't know how to yet. And when his business changed over time and women started working, his delivery business dried up. My dad didn't know anything about strategy or analysis yet. See, he wasn't an accountant or he wasn't a mechanic. He was 17 when he graduated from high school. For all of us, the goal isn't to be perfect because we're never gonna get there. The goal is to just be a little bit better than you were before. And my dad adopted this philosophy of doing things he'd never experienced in order to navigate forward. When things got hard, often it's just a matter of having the grit to stick with it and put that one foot in front of the other especially when it's unpleasant or you've undergone disappointment. This story, what you're going through right now in 2020, uh, whether it's really good or really bad, it's not your last story. And adding in the simple, simple possibility that you might succeed if you just keep going sometimes makes it happen because you just don't know. We often look at people in terms, successful people in terms of them being products of their success, after success, after success. But what we're really looking at is people who are just really good at moving through failures because moving through failure is often the real success. Resilience is the real success. And failure and losses are part of the process for anyone who's willing to try. I mean, if you look at Cy Young, he had the most wins in Major League Baseball, 511. He also had the most losses. Nolan Ryan had the most strikeouts, over 5,700, but he also had the most walks. They just played the most of anyone in baseball. And for us, many times, it's about showing up and being there and getting back into the game, even when you've been knocked down. I remember when I ran track in high school and I couldn't break the five minute mile as a freshman. I remember my dad reframing the issue in terms of, well, you just haven't done it yet. Later, when I worked for Frito-Lay, before I joined HEB, I was asked to move to Pepsi Foods International, which is the international side of Frito's business. They asked if I spoke Spanish. Well, I'd taken Spanish in school, and when I worked for my dad's laundry, I had to speak Spanish to be other pressers. However, there's a difference between speaking Spanish and being bilingual, and semantics are important. They didn't ask me if I was bilingual, even if that's what they meant. So I said, yes, I speak Spanish. In my, my mind, I was thinking, yeah, I'm not bilingual yet. The idea of inserting the word yet into situations that haven't worked out can give you the strength to keep going. It lets you see that last little sliver of light between the door and the frame. 
And we have opportunities to insert the word yet into our lives over our entire lives if we're simply aware enough about who we are and who we want to be for our future to other people. So here we are, it's post Labor Day 2020. We're all fatigued by the ongoing challenge of COVID-19. We've been in mass since the middle of March you know, when life as we knew it fundamentally changed. And frequently I'll come home from work, my wife will have been watching the news and she'll say, do you think this is ever going to end or is it just the way that things are going to be? And all this makes me think of Jim Stockdale, who was the highest ranking military officer in prison during Vietnam. He, held, he was held in the Hanoi Hilton and repeatedly tortured for over eight years. They refer to his ability to survive when others would die after a few months in captivity as the Stockdale effect. And here's how Stockdale uh, described it. He said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I'd get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and that being a prisoner of war would turn into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I wouldn't trade. Isn't it interesting that he said that about being a prisoner of war and Naomi Warren talked about the defining moment in her life that made her a better person and she would not trade was being a Holocaust survivor. But Stockdale said, who didn't make it out? Those were the optimists. They were the ones that said, we'll be out by Christmas and then Christmas came and went. And then they'd say, oh, we'll be out by Easter. And then Easter came and went. And then they'd think Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving became Christmas and they eventually ended up dying of a broken heart. So on the one hand, what Stockdale said, it was about the unswerving faith that one will ultimately prevail, while on the other hand, it's about banishing all false hopes and just keep going one day at a time and not looking too far into the future. HEB opened our first store 115 years ago in Kerrville, Texas, and were founded by a woman, her name was Florence Butt, whose husband was too sick to work, so they took their last $60 and they formed a letter of, or got a letter of credit from a grocery distributor. And they would uh, deliver groceries there in Kerrville to local res residents in the red wagon that her son Howard Butt had. Well, the first store did so well that they opened a second store in the big town of Mason, Texas, and it promptly went out of business. And then they opened a third store and it went out of business. And they opened a fourth store and it went out of business. And they opened a fifth store and it went out of business. They all failed. You know, in Major League Baseball, if you bat below 200, which one for five would be, they call that the Mendoza line, and you don't really have a promising future in baseball, and they tell you other professions you might want to consider are. But luckily, the Butts didn't try to do something else. They opened up a sixth store in Del Rio, Texas, which was a sleepy town on the Mexico border where nobody else wanted to be, and it did well. And from there, they began to move opening stores down the border, Eagle Pass, Laredo, Brownsville, Harlingen. Basically, the strategy was to build stores where no one else wanted to be because it was hot, desolate, and there was no air conditioning. And HEB today is a $31 billion company that could have easily failed if the butts had quit after their first or their second or their third or their fourth failure. You see, oftentimes grit is more about stamina that it's then having great intensity. And if you stick with it and just keep plodding along, that oftentimes things will turn out okay and you'll find out that you were probably a lot stronger than you ever gave yourself credit for. Team that up with faith and I think it's a winning combination. So that's what I thought I would talk to you guys about today. And I thought it was relevant to, at this point in time because right now the stamina piece of persistence as we're now in the sixth month of COVID-19, in difficult times in our world, that oftentimes it's easy to say like my wife, do you think this will ever end? And it will. And we can play a part, I think, in terms of shaping a better lives, a better life for ourselves and those who are around us. So thank you. I don't doubt, uh, Tom, do you want me to take any questions about anything? Yeah. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, if, if, for those who are tuning in, if you have any questions, you know, there's a little Q&A uh, bar down at the bottom. Well, people are doing that. One of the things that I think is interesting, if you look at this summer, we had COVID, and then I'm reading the news, and then you start to hear about, hear about the killer wasps that are coming to Texas. Then you hear about, obviously, the hurricane that we just went through. 
Luckily, we sidestepped it in Houston, but in our stores that are in the Golden Triangle, maybe one of the most misapt named places in the United States because there's not much golden in terms of the aesthetics of uh, Beaumont, Port Arthur, and Orange. But it took a pretty strong shot with the hurricane. And you start to think, how much more are we going to be tested by? And I think what we found through each one of these is because we knew how to do a hurricane. We weren't sure we knew how to do a hurricane uh, during, a, during a COVID crisis. And uh, thank God that the wasps stayed up north and they didn't come down this way. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Let's see. Can I tap <laughs> yeah. on the Q&A here? Let's see. Yeah, or I, or I can ask them to you. Yeah, I can just read them to you. So one would be, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your nonprofit work, you know, sure. a good reason or any other things you're involved in? Sure. Um, Good Reason Houston is a nonprofit that we developed um, simply because one of, the, one of the amazing things about working in a supermarket is that I get to work with people of all shapes, sizes, ethnicities, and where they come from on the economic scale. Um, and that's one of the things I love most about working here. But generally people don't say, oh, when I grow up, I want to work in a grocery store. Um, people end up going to work part-time in high school and then they find out that they like it. And I always know we've got them when um, they say, oh, I was on vacation, I saw this great grocery store. That's when I know they're fully invested in working at HEB. But uh, only 30% of my store managers have college degrees, but they all have advanced degrees in, uh, in common sense. And the majority of them are running businesses that uh, run between 50 and uh, $100 million per year per store, given our average weekly volumes that we run. But what I've come to realize is, is that, uh, look, you can't choose your parents and you can't, you can't choose the zip code that you were born into. And while I've been lucky in my life, in part, because I had a dad who pushed me and I had good teachers along the way that took a real interest in me, was that I was able to jump, jump socioeconomic classes in my life and live the American dream. But today, only 11% of young people can do that. And if you're born poor, it becomes increasingly hard. And so what Good Reason Houston works to do is to say that all kids, regardless of your parents, regardless of your zip code, have access to a great public school education, whether that comes in the form of a charter school or a traditional public school. But today, only 40% uh, of third graders in HISD read at grade level in the third grade. Only 20% of high school graduates in the greater Houston area go on to achieve a two-year or four-year degree uh, within six years of graduation, yet 60% of all the jobs that have been created require one. So there's a real opportunity, and the way to break the, break the cycle of poverty clearly is through education, and that's what we work on. So here you got a longer answer than what you anticipated. Uh, that's beautiful. And just to answer a couple of things that are popping up, yes, we record these uh, talks all the time, and we include a link to the video in our weekly uh, toolbox emails. And uh, in a few days, it'll be available on our website too. So you'll be able to come back and circle through. So thanks, thanks for your interest in that. I'm gonna take something and try to condense a few of the other questions I see okay. here, Scott. And one would be this, I love that expression, motion is the lotion. I'm sure I will steal that and use that uh, somewhere along the line. But we talk about the, the role of faith and perseverance or resiliency and and uh, I'm, I'm sure you've been living in a world where there's tons of pressure on you and in the midst of all things. So what about those days where you just, you just, you just don't have it to get up and do the next thing, you know, when you're having, or, or for a person who's saying, I'm trouble getting to the, I'm having trouble putting yet in right now. I'm kind of in a hole, you know, yeah. any, any kind of insights and experiences there you might share and, and maybe whether it's faith or. Yeah, look, look, I think we all have, um, uh, we all have times in our lives where we're dealt a serious blow, whether it's professionally or, uh, or personally. Um, uh, I've gone through them in my life. You've gone through, anyone who's on here has gone that. And you think to yourself, I'm not sure I can make through this. And I think, obviously, searching to a higher power, uh, asking for God's help and, and intervention in terms of helping you to get up. Uh, but oftentimes people will tell me, you know, should be, I, I remember I worked for a guy who didn't get a promotion once and he and he was so mad, he just went home that day. He just left work and he went home. And, and I've always thought, you know, when we're dealt disappointment, we really have three viable op or three options. Not all of them I think are viable. Uh, one is to quit. And, and that happened to me once at HEB, that something happened at HEB. And I, so I went back and I said, look, 
this may not be working out for you. It may not be working out for me. You know, maybe it might be best if I moved along and, uh, and went to the next place in my life and my career. And so, you know, quitting is an option if something is violated in terms of a trust or you can't see any possibility for a better future is that sometimes quitting and looking for the next open door can be a decent option. Uh, another option that I've seen people do is pout. That was my boss who went home that day. I just don't think that's a particularly viable option. Like uh, you, get a, you get mired down in self-pity of feeling bad for yourself or the other way is to pick yourself up and dust yourself off. At one point, um, I had been being groomed to be the president of HEB and a woman was promoted ahead of me. And I, it was a dark day. And I remember shutting my door and sitting in my office for a few minutes and just thinking like, what is the appropriate response here? And I didn't necessarily see what was gonna be served by leaving or by pouting. So I called her up and said, look, I wanna let you, I wanna congratulate you and let you know, I'm gonna work as hard as I can for you for as long as I'm here. And that's my commitment to you. And, uh, and it was one of those things of fighting through the pain. I remember my daughter got cut from the dance team when she was a sophomore and she said, I just can't go to school tomorrow, I'm too embarrassed. And I think what I've found through these situations is that if you'll just force yourself, that oftentimes from somewhere in the depths of you, you find the strength to go on and then you end up learning more about yourself and the potential of what it is you can overcome, whether it's physically or emotionally. And it's not fun to have to go through and do, but I can look back on the times when I have had my greatest failure and I can draw upon what happened and use that as learning to either ensure it won't happen again or look at how I can do things better in the future. So I guess that's the way I've kind of looked at it. Yeah, oh, that's excellent. Good. So uh, somebody wants to know if you had the opportunity to talk to anyone from any time. Uh, if, you, if you could talk to anyone who ever existed, uh, who would you talk to? And what's the one question you'd want to ask them? Boy, that's a deep one. Isn't huh? that a that's good one? Really, that's really a hard one. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, just off the top of my head, I would probably go, you, you think about somebody who really had to persevere and overcome difficult times in our country would have been Abraham Lincoln and how he had... Um, how he had the fortitude to keep going when so many people on both sides of the war were being killed. Um, and, and the fact that there wasn't always great support for what he was doing. And he had a cabinet that didn't always agree. And so as a result, he had to at times work in it. And so like, how did he do that? And especially at a time, you know, 150 years ago or more 170 years ago, I guess now, uh, at a time when there was really, there weren't leadership books, there weren't seminars, you had to draw on your own instincts. And who did he turn to when he needed strength? Uh, uh, what uh, uh, beyond, obviously Abraham Lincoln was a religious uh, man, but beyond uh, looking to God, that where else did he draw his strength and his fortitude from? So I guess off the top of my head, that may, might be the first place I'd go to. Yeah, that's great. That was really good. Uh, uh, several people want to know, this is just, this just, just us gawkers looking on. Some people want to know what it's like to do commercial with hotshot professional athletes. <laughs> yeah, well, so you, you talk about the change in COVID. I just did commercials last week with uh, Deshaun Watson and Justin Reed, but I did it via Zoom, just like we're doing right now. And it's so interesting because you have to set up a little iPad. It was just me and my computer. And then my wife had a sewing light that I put on myself and my wife did my makeup for me. Uh, and uh, so I wouldn't shine on my forehead like I'm doing today. And, you know, so then you're getting cues and, and feedback from someone over an iPad while you're trying to do a commercial. And part of my, this ad is, is nonverbals. Like they go, okay, we want you to look confused. And like, well, I look confused all the time. Anyway, this is an acting, but then we're like, and so for like two minutes, I just had me do different takes of looking confused. But I will say one of the, the real great joys of moving to Houston, you know, when I got asked to move to Houston 20 years ago, I lived in San Antonio, worked for HEB, and I went home, I said to my wife, they're asking us to move to Houston. We need to come up with a reason not to go. We don't want to live in Houston. And we couldn't come up with a reason, so we went. And a year later, my wife and I looked at ourselves and said, what are we thinking of? This is like the best place we've ever lived. It's just humid, that's all. And so then you know, we decided that we would have someone from HEB be in the commercials and they said, we need somebody who's willing to be self-deprecating and, 
and uh, and as a little bit of a ham, I said, well, that sounds like me. I guess I could do that. And so we started doing these ads and clearly I've gotten to meet so many interesting people and I've enjoyed maybe other than Brock Osweiler, every single one of them. And again, no one in Houston liked Brock Osweiler um, when he was with the Texans, but uh, every, it's like each star has been better than the next. And I, I would say if I had to pick a single favorite, it might be Deshaun Watson. And not that he's the best actor. I mean, look, when you see him interviewed on TV, he doesn't have a big personality. He reminds me a lot of Tim Duncan when I lived in San Antonio in that he's understated, but so committed to what it is that he does. Deshaun's strong in his faith. Yeah. Um, he's certainly grounded. And you can just see his commitment in order to raise himself up because you think about somebody who's lived a difficult life, he has. But you can see that it doesn't go to his head. I don't know if you saw last week that someone was getting evicted out of their apartment and, and uh, Deshaun like, this is terrible. Let me see what I can do to step in and help. And, and it, what has been interesting to look at sports stars is many of them get it. Like a Vince Wilfrick wasn't the best player, but he was so outgoing and worked hard to make the experience of being in an ad, not just good for himself, but good for us. It made me want to come back and find other things that he could do so that his career extended beyond the playing field. And I think Deshaun is that way. Clearly, J.J. Watt has been the master of it. And so, I don't know, I always say, look, if, if, if my daughter brought home Deshaun Watson and said, this is my new boyfriend, I'd just be so proud because I think he represents the NFL well, I think he represents the city of Houston well, and he clearly represents the Texans well. Yeah, that is great. Man, I thank you so much for, for taking time on those things. And, and there's more, but I'm sure we're, we're about out of time. But I, I thank you for the topic. The, the stories about your dad and that you had this model to look to. I was to say, this is Yeah, this is, this is how I press on. You know, I, I've got something that puts flesh and, and, and bone to, to what it means to, to keep going even when I don't want to. In fact, uh, I even, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, the, the topic of perseverance and endurance, you know, from the perspective of, of uh, the Bible and faith, it's huge, you know, in terms of enduring and God using the endurance in a way that shapes us and builds us in great ways, including thinking of him saying it was for the joy set before him that Jesus himself endured the cross. I mean, it was, it was, it was that, the you know, point. there's this, it, this is not yet. Is it, was that, was that good or pleasurable? Or of course not. Um, but there was the anticipation of what God would do in, in, in giving his son for, for, well, you've just, all you of just it. pulled it around full circle and that's a great way I think to end on. Yeah. So, uh, so thanks for that, and thanks to everybody. Uh, Scott, uh, again, on behalf of everybody, we'll, we'll let uh, Mike move you off the screen now, but thank you so much for being here. I know you've got plenty to do, and hey, I, I, I said it to you earlier. i more than my HUB. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll see okay. you. Thank you so much, Bye-bye, see you.